Welcome to the ITX build. In this three part series we'll show you everything you need to create the most ultimate mini 4K PC that is just as comfortable on your desk as it is in the living room. In this video, part two, we'll be showing you how this PC was put together, showing you all the steps along the way. Regardless of whether you've built a small ITX PC or not before, hopefully this guide should show you exactly how it was done. And like all PCs, it starts with reading the instruction manuals, as all motherboards and cases are slightly different, and it will save you some time later on. Grab yourself a screwdriver and somewhere to keep your screws safe, and then it's time to begin. The first step is to remove the front cover of the case, the dust filter, and then the stock fan. This is all going to depend on the entire parts you actually go for, but here I'm replacing it with a Corsair H80i water cooler. While we won't fit that to later on, it's worth removing the stock fan now so that we've got more room to work with. It's simply a case of unscrewing and then removing. If we are using a different fan later on, then the fans actually come with this grill which will stop you getting a load of cables jamming up your fan. It's worth removing and replacing these if you're using different fans. Now it's time to pick up your case and start removing the side panels. We've got three to remove, the left, the top and the right. These are all easily removable with the thumb screws. They might be a little bit tight so you might need to use a screwdriver, but once you've taken them off once they will be nice and loose and you won't need to worry about tightening them too much on their way back. Keep these somewhere safe, you want to easily find them but obviously you don't want to scratch them, remembering to keep all your screws nice and safe in a little pot or similar. Then it's time to remove the hard drive bay cover and in here you'll find a little box. This box contains all your goodies that you'll need to actually get this thing installed. This includes things like screws for the hard drives, screws for the motherboards and miscellaneous items such as cable ties and other accessories. It's going to depend on the case you get but regardless pick them all up and keep them somewhere safe as we'll be using them throughout this build. So now that's all out of the way it's time to grab our case, put it aside just for now and grab our motherboard box. This is important because not only does it hold our motherboard, but it's a nice surface for actually building our motherboard components on top of. Remove your motherboard from its anti-static bag and then place it on top of the box. Now it's time to start working. Grab our RAM and processor and it's time to get them installed. RAM is nice and easy as it only goes in one way. Simply line up the slots with the slots on the motherboard and press them in. You'll notice that there's a little catch on the left hand side of the motherboard and this is how you check that they've actually gone in properly thus making sure our RAM is safe. Unlike the RAM that does take a fair amount of force to actually seat properly, the processor is definitely the opposite. It requires no force whatsoever. Simply remove the cover protecting your processor socket, find the gold arrow on your processor and then line this up with the motherboard. This means it can only go in one way and when you do drop it into place it requires no force. If you have to force it in then you're definitely doing something wrong. Once this is in, simply lower the catch into its place and there we are, processor installed. As we're building in a small ITX case, I'm installing the CPU backplate before we put it in the computer. Simply grab your backplate, make sure the posts are in the appropriate position and then push it into place. Then it's time to grab the appropriate screws. Make sure you're using the right ones. I actually accidentally used the AMD ones by accident and it meant I had to then remove the motherboard later. Don't be stupid like me, look at the manual and make sure you're using the proper Intel ones. Then it's time to grab your case and flick it round several times admiring your work, grab the IO shield and stick it in the slot. This requires a fair amount of force and it literally does just clip in. You know when it's in because it will not fall out. Now it's time to actually start thinking about getting this motherboard in the case. To do so we need to remove the 5 and a quarter inch drive bay cover from the top of the case. Simply unscrew this and put this somewhere safe. Unless you're never going to use it, then you can use it as a paperweight or you can use it as decoration. Regardless, remove it from the case, put it aside, grab your cables that come in the case, untie them, tuck them out of the way, grab our motherboard and then slot this into position. This should be fairly simple as it lines up with the holes, which you then need to screw into with the motherboard screws provided with your case. It's very simple and doesn't require much screwing at all as this is a small mini ITX motherboard. With that all out of the way, it's time to start thinking about your cooling. Because I'm replacing the stock fans, I'm doing that now to give myself a little bit more room, but if you're using an air cooler and if you're not replacing the fans, you won't really need to bother. Now it's time to grab our power supply and get it installed. 
There's some screws on the back of the case and this reveals a little plate that simply attaches to the power supply and then it allows it to slide into your case with minimal effort. So attach this bracket to your power supply, making sure that the fan of the power supply is pointing in the appropriate direction. In most cases, this will be downwards as it ventilates from the bottom of the case, but make sure you're not ventilating nothing because you've got your fan facing a wall. Then, if you're using a modular power supply, it's time to grab the power supply cables, route them through the case, and then into the back of the power supply. Simply repeat this until all of the cables are done, and then you can simply slide your power supply into your case, and then replace the screws on the back of the case. This means that it should be fairly simple to get everything plugged in, as you won't need to be worrying about having too many cables from a non-modular power supply, and you won't be reaching in once you've got this thing installed. Routing the cables should be fairly simple. You just need to tuck these into the appropriate caverns of the case so that they are as far out the way as possible. Here we have the 4-pin at the top of the motherboard and then the 24-pin motherboard connections. Simply plug them in and then tuck the cables as far out the way as possible to give ourselves maximum room for fitting everything else. Now it's time to grab your drives. Here we've only got one SSD, but regardless we just need to put this into the quick drive caddy and insert it into the case. Do this for all your drives as it's very simple to do for both the 2.5 and 3.5 inch drives. Then grab a SATA connection from your motherboard and insert it into the back followed by the SATA power connection from your power supply. Now it's time to finish where we left off with the cooling. I'm using two 120mm fans as an exhaust on the right hand side of the case. Make sure you get these screwed in nice and tight, with the power connections facing downwards, and this just means that it's going to be easier to route our cables. I was originally going to use the HATI water cooler here, but didn't have enough clearance, so I'm going to use it on the front. Regardless, grab your power connections and then route them to the appropriate place in the case. I've got one motherboard header near the CPU and then one a little bit further down on the board. These simply go in just by pushing in nice and simply, but refer to your motherboard manual to check exactly where they are and to make sure you've actually got enough fan headers because ITX motherboards tend to have less than the ATX counterparts. Now it's time to insert our graphics card. Unscrew and then remove the PCIe brackets, grab your graphics card, line it up with the PCIe slot and then push it into place. It simply clicks so you know when it is in place. However, if you are using a very large graphics card like we've got here, it doesn't really drop into place and required quite a lot of manoeuvring to get it in place. You may have already noticed I had to remove the RAM to get this in and I also had to remove the PCI bracket holder thing itself and this took me about half an hour to actually fit this in the case which is why I said that with a big disclaimer that this graphics card is very hard to get in this case. But as you can tell, with a fair amount of effort and a bit of know-how, it is doable. Just make sure if you do go for this card that you remove the PCI bracket on the back of the case as this was the solution for me. Then it's time to screw in your graphics card and plug it into its power connections. Here we've got one 8-pin and one 6-pin, so it's just a case of getting these plugged in, flattened down a bit, and then we should be ready for the next step. Connect the cables that came with your case onto the relevant headers onto the motherboard, and then find the SATA connections from your drives and plug these into the SATA ports on the motherboard. Then, if you're using one, grab your water cooler and attach it to the front of the case. Make sure it's in place and it's screwed in with four screws. Then you need to get a fan and then actually attach this from the other side to your radiator. If you're not using a radiator, then obviously you need to follow the instructions for the cooler that you are using. Make sure you use a static pressure fan if you're using one on the front. If you are using a water cooler, it's now time to lower the pump head down onto the four posts that we've pre-applied, and then screw down in a cross pattern to avoid stress on the CPU. Make sure that you're using thermal paste if it doesn't come pre-applied, and then you pretty much got everything ready to go. Just plug in the last couple of power connections from your fans and from your pump head, and then you have a finished build. As you can see here, it's not the cleanest build out there. There is just the nature really with ITX builds. I'm sure I could get it slightly better than this, but the tr trouble is it's just not really that easy in such a small space. My overall conclusion of the case itself will come in a full review, but if you want something that's fairly easy to build in and has a wide array of functionality in the sense that you can fit a lot of things in, then this is a pretty good shout. But if you want the smallest case on the market, then this still isn't it. But regardless, it's now time to get this thing set up. Grab yourself a keyboard, mouse, USB with Windows, display, and of course the power connections, plug it in, and we're ready to go. Booting onto Windows is fairly simple, you just need to set it up. This is done by booting into the USB drive, selecting the drive you want to install Windows on, and then pretty much just let it do its thing. Note that you probably won't have an internet connection as soon as this is done, 
Though if you're using Wi-Fi that did actually manage to work. So it will be a good idea if you grab all your drivers and tools beforehand, download them to a USB drive and then you can get them installed and ready to go. And now this is a gaming ready machine. We'll be talking about gaming performance in the next video so you can see exactly what this thing can do. But overall, I think it's a really decent build. It does everything I wanted it to do. I didn't need it to be the absolute smallest thing out there. I just wanted something that I could move from place to place very easily. And living room gaming, there's a lot of different ways of doing it. There's streaming, there's having a dedicated PC. But if you can just pick it up and move it, that's really what I was after. And by using a keyboard and mouse that's built into a wireless trackpad-like device, it really does mean that you can move the PC from place to place and enjoy games in two locations. With sales of 4K TVs going up and up all the time, there are so few devices out there that can really take advantage of them and use them for what they were designed for. We've got things like the Xbox One S and of course a load of streaming services and UHD Blu-ray coming out, but to be able to have a PC that you can easily just move from one location to the other, utilize HDMI 2.0, and in a fair amount of games, be able to get 4K ultra settings at 60 frames a second, this is definitely something that your 4K TV has been waiting for. And playing Just Cause 3 on this TV has been absolutely phenomenal. But I won't tease you too much as the full gaming performance and what it's like on a ultra wide G-Sync monitor and what it's like on a 4K TV is coming in the next video. So if you haven't already, subscribe and get that straight to your inbox. And there we go, the end of part two. A massive thank you, if you haven't seen part one, you can check it out in the little eye in the top right hand corner. Likewise, as soon as part two is available, then you can find that in the top right hand corner. A massive thank you for you guys for watching, I really appreciate it. I hope you've enjoyed it. If you have, hit the like button. If you haven't, hit the dislike button. A massive thank you to Asus, Corsair, and of course Intel for providing the parts for this build. It wouldn't have been possible without you guys. And if you do want to see more videos like this, Please subscribe, and if you have any questions, leave them down below, or of course hit me up on at PCCentric on the relevant social media, so Twitter, Instagram, everywhere really. A massive thank you, and I'll hopefully see you in part three.